Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of text that we read just a few moments ago in Exodus chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. We're talking about the covenant that God made with Israel to give them a specific land mass, a divine land grant, guaranteed title that cannot ever be abrogated. It belongs to them, held in trust while they are out of the land by God himself. And though there have been squatters on the land, and there are still squatters on the land today, God says it belongs to Israel. We saw that covenant in verse 4 of the passage we just read. And I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. That's God speaking to Moses and telling Moses that now is the time that God is going to fulfill that covenant. He's going to deliver Israel out of the land of Egypt, bring them across the Red Sea, bring them through the years of wilderness wandering, bring them into the land and give them victory in the land. And God says, I will establish that covenant forever. We've seen many passages where God guaranteed that covenant to Israel. He also guaranteed that when Israel sinned, he would cast them out of the land. That was his discipline for their disobedience, but that the covenant still remained in force, driven out temporarily, but restored. We've seen that that has occurred three times with two restorations thus far, and the third restoration is in progress. We're on the cusp of the cup, so to speak, before they fall into God's wonderful well of blessing. But there are some things that have to happen first. And that's what we've been looking at as we have discussed the covenant of the land over these many weeks. We've learned 27 things so far about the covenant. Last week brought us to 25 and we only got two more last week. In fact, one of those two is such a big topic in scripture that we're going to have to spend most of our time on that today. In fact, it's a, a topic that affects you. It's a topic that affects me. It's a topic that affects the United States as we have relationship with Israel. It's a topic that determines some things about your heavenly rewards, whether you'll get them or whether you will not. It's a topic that determines certain things about what is going to happen to you in this temporal life, not merely in eternity. It's a very big topic. In fact, it is one of the main themes of the entire Old Testament and New Testament. Well, that's why we're going to continue on it today, because we could only touch the very first part of it at the end of the message last week. What we've learned so far, 27 things. The covenant of the land sets the conditions by which Israel entered the land. Number two, it set the conditions necessary to remain in the land. Three, it set the conditions necessary to ultimately inherit the entire land from the Nile River to the Euphrates River. They've never done that yet. Number four, it says that the land is an everlasting possession. Number five, it guarantees that when Israel is expelled from the land because of sin, God holds it in escrow for them until he irresistibly draws them back to the land as he is doing today. We talked about that, how that even in the midst of this terrorist activity that's going on there right now, in the month of July, over 500 American Jews emigrated to Israel. They would have had it nice and easy here, but in the midst of all the terrorist attacks, they said, we think we ought to go to Israel and make that our homeland. Folks, that's irresistible drawing of God. Nobody moves to a terrorist activity area just on their own when they have it nice and comfortable here in the U.S. God is irresistibly drawing them back to the land. Number six, it guarantees that God will bring them back because Jehovah's covenants with Israel simply cannot be broken. Number seven, the covenant of the land is an unconditional promise that therefore guarantees that Israel, Israel as a nation, will be a nation forever. Very important. That helps us understand why Israel is not the church. We're not a nation. Israel is a nation. Number eight, the covenant of the land guarantees that the ultimate fulfillment is totally unconditional. It is their land forever. Number nine, it is a prophetic covenant. Number ten, God always fulfills prophecy literally, specifically, naturally, visibly, and physically. Number 11, because future promises to Israel are prophetic, denial of the literal interpretation of prophecy is an attack on the inspiration of Scripture. Do not let that one slide under the boards. 
There are a lot of people today who allegorize, mythologize, and cast away prophecy and say that it doesn't mean what it says it means. I am so tired of hearing, and I hear this all the time out of so-called reformed circles, well, that's not what it really means. Really? I am really tired of hearing that's not what it really means. God spoke and he did not stutter. When God says something, he means it. Every prophecy that has ever been fulfilled has been fulfilled literally and specifically and exactly like God said it would be fulfilled. We don't always understand it in advance, but suddenly it comes to pass and we say, wow, why didn't I see that before? Over 300 prophecies concerning Jesus Christ were fulfilled literally at his first coming. Literally. Now you work the mathematical odds on that and you will see that that is impossible unless God is in control. Very important point when we look at the covenant of the land. Number 12, believing prophetic truth results in holy living. If you believe what the Bible says about the future, it will change your life. No ifs, ands, and buts about it. If you believe what the Bible says about the future, about prophecy, it will change your life, the way you're living right now. You've heard me say it before, you'll hear me say it many times again. So you say you're a Christian. How has it changed, changed your life? Boy, that's important. If you claim to be a Christian and there has been no transformation, no change in your life, you better examine your faith because that probably means that you're not saved. God takes you as you are, but he never leaves you as you are. The work of the Holy Spirit of God, taking the Word of God in your heart, transforms you day by day, step by step, into the image of Christ. You don't do it. It's the Spirit of God working in you. You simply yield to Him. You present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed unto this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12, 1 and 2. God changes lives. If he hasn't done something in your life, maybe you haven't had the contact with God that you think you had. He is the one who does it. He is the one who transforms you because his goal is to conform you to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Can you look back a year ago and see how God has worked in your life, made some changes, made some transformation? Can you look back 20 years and see, wow, I was at that point 20 years ago, and now look how God has changed my life. What a difference. For those of you who are older, can you look back 50 or 60 years ago and see how God has changed your life from that point to the present? You have not yet reached perfection. None of us have. We should be able to see visible mile markers as we ponder the work of God in our lives over the years. Things whereby we have been changed and are being brought closer and closer and closer to what Jesus Christ is like in the way that we think, in the way that we talk, in the things that we do and the things that we abstain from doing. In our motivations, why we do what we do. In our attitudes, how we respond to external stimuli and why we act the way we do. Attitudes, that's a tough one. Motivation, that's a tough one. But God can crack the hardest nut. Remember that. It's not you doing it. It's God doing it in you and through you as you yield to the Spirit of God, transforming your life into the likeness of Jesus Christ. He is your goal. He is your example. It's not the law. It's Jesus Christ. The law can never save you. The law can never sanctify you. Keeping the Ten Commandments won't do it for you. It's Jesus Christ who transforms you. 
Oh, how we need to learn that. I'm sorry I get uh, carried away on something, especially that. Uh, we need to move on. Believing prophetic truth results in holy living. Israel would be cast out of the land because of sin, occurred three times. We mentioned two restorations thus far. Israel will be fully restored to the land upon repentance. We're going to spend some time on that today. There's a partial restoration currently in progress. Repentance must come before the Messiah sets up his millennial kingdom. The Old Testament says that over and over. Jesus said that over and over. John the Baptist said that. The disciples said that over and over. Repentance must come before Messiah sets up his millennial kingdom. John said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The Lord Jesus Christ said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He picked up that same message after Herod killed John. Repentance before the kingdom was a message Jesus told the disciples to preach. The message of repentance is the key. It is the key to the covenant of the land. National repentance. God is going to use the great tribulation called the time of Jacob's trouble or the time of Jacob's sorrow in the Bible to bring national repentance to Israel. That promise, number 20, includes both halves of the divided kingdom, both Israel and Judah. Number 21, Paul uses the repentance of Israel as a nation to prove, and we saw this in Romans 9, 10, and 11, God uses the repentance of national Israel to prove the elective purposes of God. Folks, that's rather important if you believe in election. It's the visible illustration that Paul gives to prove election. Number 22. God sovereignly ordained the temporary fall of Israel to open the door for Gentile salvation and to bring Israel to repentance. <laughs> Paul says it's to provoke them to jealousy. They say, whoa! We missed our Messiah, and now the Gentiles are going to get to come in? <laughs> says, for to provoke them to jealousy. He's used that temporary fall to bring them to that point of repentance. Number 23, the church does not replace Israel. The church does not become Israel. The church is merely grafted into the root. Israel as a nation will be regrafted into the root, though they have been temporarily broken off. When Israel as a nation repents, the church and Israel are two separate branches that are grafted into the same root of the Messiah. Number 24, Israel's national repentance and salvation comes at the end of the seven-year Great Tribulation period. Number 25, during the final three days of the Tribulation, God will open their eyes, they will repent, and they will return to the Lord. And now we come to part eight that we had last week. We started two things. Number 26, chastening of Israel is proof of three things. Israel has been through chastening three times. They've been restored twice. They're in the midst of being restored, but they still have some chastening to go through before the final restoration takes place. But the chastening proves three things. Listen carefully because this applies to us too. Chastening proves, number one, God's love. Chastening proves God's love. Number two, chastening proves the election by God. Number two, chastening proves the election by God. Number three, chastening proves God's guarantee of repentance. If God did not chasten, there would be no repentance. Chastening proves the guarantee of God bringing Israel and us as his children to repentance. Number one, God's love. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. Romans 11, 28. That same principle applies to us. Hebrews 12, verse 5. 
And have you forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children? My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. You say, man, I've had a tough life. Man, I've had to go through some really bad things. Man, you know, I don't know what God's doing in my life, but it sure hurts. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Why does he chasten you? Because he wants to bring you to the very bottom and bring you to repentance where you have no place else to turn and you say, Lord, I have sinned. Change my life. Change my life. God is like the refiner's fire described in the Old Testament. And here you have gold ore or silver ore. And it's put into that massive cauldron. And the fire is turned up underneath the cauldron. And it gets hotter and hotter and hotter. It's called smelting. And as it gets hotter and hotter, the precious metal begins to run out of the rock. The rocks crack. And they give up all that gold and all that silver. And because the gold and silver is heavier than the rock, the rock floats. And the gold and the silver runs down into the bottom of the pot. And the smelter, the one stoking the fire, he takes a ladle and he skims off the rock and the dross that has floated to the surface. And then he turns up the fire some more and more of that stuff comes to the surface and he skims it off. Until finally after the fire has reached its hottest and there is no more coming to the surface, he looks down into the pot and there is pure gold. And he can see his own image reflected in the gold. Dear people, do you know that God has called you to reflect the image of Jesus Christ? So that when people see you, they see a reflection of Christ. Do you know how God accomplishes that purification? So that all the sin and the wickedness and the dross and the slag and the waste product bubbles to the surface where he skims it off. It's by putting you through the fire. We don't like that process. It's not fun. It's not pleasant. It doesn't give you the jollies that the world gives you. It doesn't give you a buzz. It doesn't leave you so out of it that you don't know what's going on around you, like drugs and alcohol and all those other things that people do. He puts you through the fire to get rid of that stuff. And the more you resist it, the hotter the fire is going to get. Handel's Messiah says, it's quoting a passage in the Old Testament dealing with the Levites, the ones who were to be the priests before God, the ones who were to deal with the holy things. And he shall purify the sons of Levi, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Like a refiner's fire, he will purify the sons of Levi. Those who would serve him, those who would offer the holy things before him, those who would walk in his paths, those who would enter his presence, he will refine like a refiner's fire and purify you. Well, here I am preaching again and not getting through my notes. <laughs> Sorry about that. Number 27. Chastening is designed to remove three bad attitudes in the people of God. Chasing is designed to remove three bad attitudes in the people of God, both Israel and the church, I might say. We began that section last week. We hope to finish it this week. It's a major theme of the entire Bible, as I said just a moment ago. But God designs chastening to remove three bad attitudes. What are the three attitudes that God is dealing with through chastening? 
What are the attitudes that God is dealing with with Israel before they can obtain the covenant of the land? That's why he's chasing them till they repent. God chastens recalcitrant children. God himself said that Israel is a rebellious, number one, two, stubborn, and three, stiff-necked people. Those are the three key words, and they are they're related, but they're each different. We're going to talk about those differences because we may see a little bit of that in ourselves. And God gave Israel as a visible symbol so that we will know how God is going to deal with us if we are rebellious, if we are stubborn, and if we are stiff-necked. Three key words. That's what God said about the Jews. It's not what I said. God still loves them and God still loves us even when we're like that. But God will chasten us if we have those three bad attitudes. Number one, stiff-necked. What does stiff-necked mean? Well, all of you have had kids and I've had kids, <laughs> 13 of them. And on occasion when I was trying to talk to them, they were standing like this. So I put my hand down around the back of their head to tip it up and look at me. And they would stiffen their neck. If I wanted to pull them forward, they'd pull back. If I wanted to pull them back, they'd pull forward. <laughs> You've all been kids, right? Do you remember any time that you might have responded to your parents in that way? Maybe they never stuck their hand around the back of your head like I did sometimes with my kids, but, but you could feel yourself tensing up. You could feel the muscles in your neck getting tight. You could feel your shoulders coming up. You could feel the, the grimace on your face as the muscles in your face tighten and your brow was furrowing and you weren't very happy about what you were being told. That's stiff neck. Bullheaded, we would say. Will not bow the head in submission. Holds the head up in pride. Pulls back the head in defiance when given instruction or when those in authority try to give you gentle guidance. That's being stiff necked. Listen to what God said about Israel. And he said it all the way back in the days of Moses when they're crossing the Red Sea. Exodus 32 9 and the Lord said unto Moses I have seen this people and behold it is a stiff-necked people now you know political correctness today says that you cannot say anything is characteristic of a particular group of people well God said this about a group of people not just about one or two of them he said it about a group of people the Lord said unto Moses I have seen this people and behold it is a stiff-necked people Next chapter, verse 3. Unto a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. God was getting very exasperated with them. He says, you want to go into that land of milk and honey, I don't know if I'm going to go with you, because you are so stiff-necked. You will not follow the direction I want you to go. I want you to lead you to the right, you want to go to the left. I want to lead you to the left, you want to go to the right. I want you to go forward, you want to go backwards. You're a stiff-necked people. Verse 5, For the Lord had said unto Moses, Say unto the children of Israel, Ye are a stiff-necked people. I will come up into the midst of thee in a moment and consume thee. Therefore now put off thy honors from thee, that I may know what to do with thee. They were so busy thinking about how they looked. We live in that kind of culture, don't we? All dolled up. All decked out. Ready to do the fun stuff. All covered with their earrings and with their bracelets and with their necklaces and with their rings and with all the fancy little things that they wore. And they wore these little gizmos around their feet that made them tinkle when they walked. They were really consumed with their appearance and how cool they were. Folks, we live in that society. Put off your ornaments. I'm going to come to the midst, in the midst of you in a moment and consume you. Put them off so that I can know what I'm going to do with you. Verse 9. And he said, If now I have found grace in thy sight, this is Moses speaking, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us. For it is a stiff-necked people. And pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine inheritance. Moses is begging for those rebels. That's, that boggles the mind. God had just said to Moses, Look, I'll kill them, and I'll make a nation out of you. How's that? Sounds like a good plan? Most of us would have said, yeah, Lord, let's go for it. I'm here. I'm all yours. Let's go for it. Moses didn't. Moses said, yeah, we're stiff-necked people. Forgive our iniquity. And you know why he said that? He said it because he said, Lord, what will that do to your name? 
Because all the nations will hear that you're the Lord, you're the one who brought them out of Egypt, you brought them into the wilderness, but they were so bad you couldn't bring them into the promised land, you had to kill them and start over again. Moses was concerned about the name of God, about the honor and glory of God. So Moses didn't say, yeah, let's be selfish, I'll do that for me. Moses said, Lord, I'm concerned about what the nations will think of your name. Moses was a faithful man. Moses was a leader who wanted the glory of God and cared nothing for his own glory. That's the kind of men that God uses. Men are most concerned about the testimony of Jesus Christ no matter what it costs them personally. Most of us, unfortunately, only care about what's the next pleasurable thing that we think we can blow our money on. There's a difference between that and the man Moses. Deuteronomy chapter 9, beginning in verse 6. Understand therefore that the Lord thy God, Moses speaking to the people, the Lord thy God giveth thee not this good land to possess it for thy righteousness, for thou art a stiff-necked people. We're back to the covenant of the land. God did it because God made a promise to Abraham. And God keeps his promises. God's not giving you this land, says Moses to Israel, because you are so righteous. Don't think that you're such goody-goody two-shoes. Because you are a stiff-necked people. Verse 13, Furthermore, the Lord spake unto me, saying, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Are you getting the idea? Chapter 10, verse 16, Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. You think you've got it because you've got physical circumcision. Don't you understand that what God is trying to teach you is you have a heart that needs to be circumcised. You are a stiff-necked people. Now, I'm going to have to pick up my glasses because otherwise I can't see. That's what happens when you get excited. <laughs> Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be ye no more stiff-necked. 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verse 8. Now be ye not stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto the Lord, and enter into his sanctuary which he hath sanctified forever, and serve the Lord your God, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. Do you understand the stiff-neckedness brings the wrath of God upon you? When you're stubborn, when you're stiff-necked, when you refuse to do what God has told you to do, when you refuse to walk in His ways, when you decide you're going to walk in the flesh and satisfy the flesh and all the indulgences of the lusts of the flesh and do what you want to do and then give excuses as to why you, well, I really couldn't help it. Listen, 1 Corinthians 10.13 is still in the book. It doesn't matter what your sin is, your besetting sin, the thing that clutches you, the thing that chains you down, it doesn't matter what it is. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. You can never say, The devil made me do it. You can never say, The temptation was too strong for me. You can never say, Well, I'm addicted to it. You can never say, Well, you know, there was no way to get out, because God said there is a way of escape. He's made it. You may have to crawl through the latrines to get out of the concentration camp, but there is a way of escape. It is not too strong for you. It's a common temptation. Men, women, boys, and girls have faced that same temptation ever since God made Adam and Eve and their sons. It's a common temptation. It's not unique to you. You cannot make excuses. You will give an account for it someday. When you stand before God and he'll say, I made this way of escape, I made this way of escape, I made this way of escape, and you turned aside from every way of escape and you went back to your same grubby, old, gross sin. There is a God in heaven and you will give an account. Don't forget it. Now be ye not stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto the Lord. Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 6. 
Chapter 12 is the presentation of your body as a living sacrifice. Chapter 6 is where he talks about yielding your members as members, as instruments of righteousness. Don't yield the members of your body. Doesn't matter which member you have a problem with, which member you are most tempted to use in the committing of your sin. If you yield your members as members of righteousness and not as members of wickedness, and you do it on a daily basis, it's a one day at a time routine. You yield those members, whatever it is where you're tempted, to Christ. And say, I want this to be a member of righteousness today. And God will give you victory one day at a time, one day at a time, one day at a time, until finally, that final day, you step off planet Earth and enter the presence of Jesus Christ. And you hear him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. One day at a time is all you have to do. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof, says Jesus. Don't try to take on tomorrow. Don't try to take on the next day. Don't try to take on next month, next week, next year, whatever. You have one day to deal with at a time. You don't know if you'll live tomorrow. You might be dead tonight. Make today count! New Testament, Acts chapter 7, verse 51. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do you. When you are stiff-necked, do you know who you're resisting? Stephen says it in Acts 7.51. His sermon just before he gets stoned to death because they didn't want to hear it. You do always resist the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit is the one who drew you to Christ. The Holy Spirit is the one who revealed the Word of God, inspired the Scriptures. The Holy Spirit is the one who sanctifies you. And you resist the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit is the earnest of the inheritance. The Holy Spirit is the one whom you can grieve. When you are stiff-necked, you are resisting the Holy Spirit of God. Second word in that list is the word stubborn. Stubbornness is one of the chief manifestations of pride. And you know pride is the sin of the devil. It is the pride of Satan that is described in Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28. It is the pride of Satan that caused his fall. It is the pride of Satan that keeps him motivated and still running on earth thinking that somehow he's going to beat God. Stubbornness is one of the chief manifestations of pride, of self-will, of refusal to submit to authority, the insistence on personal opinion over and judgment over the authority of others. Pride is obstinate refusal to admit wrong even in the face of overwhelming evidence and proof of error. Stubbornness is lack of submission. Stubbornness is rejection of the principles of obedience. Stubbornness, and listen carefully, Stubbornness is a precursor to moral defection. Stubbornness is a precursor to moral defection. In the Bible, stubbornness is given as the external manifestation of a hardening of the heart toward God. Moral defection. Let me give you an illustration. Judges chapter 2, verse 19. It came to pass when the judge was dead that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them, and they ceased not from their own doing. Stubbornness, remember, stubbornness is I'm going to do it my way. I'll have it my way. That is a theme of our society, folks. They ceased not from their own doings, nor from their stubborn way. Listen to what God says through David the psalmist in Psalm 78 verse 8. 
and might not be as their fathers. It's all going back to what Israel was like back there in the days of Moses. Not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation. A generation that set not their heart aright, and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. Stubbornness goes back to an issue of the heart. Stubbornness goes back to an issue of the spirit set not their heart aright, and in whose spirit was not steadfast with God. Third word, rebellion. What did God say about Israel in the rebellion? Rebellion, this is the point. Now we've talked about the distinctions so far between stubbornness and the stiff neck. What about rebellion? Rebellion is the point at which the internal stubbornness breaks through the surface like a boil that pops and actively seeks to overthrow authority before it's all contained. It's festering down there, but now it's breaking out and seeking to overthrow authority. Rebellion taunts authority with the question, so what are you going to do about it? Have you ever heard anybody say something like that? So what are you going to do about it? You know, many years ago I was pastoring in a church and a man came to me in tears. He had just discovered that his wife was committing adultery. And he said, I was so angry I went and confronted the man that was doing it. And he just laughed at me and said, so what are you going to do about it? That people is sick. That is rebellion against the highest authority, God, who said that the marriage vows were sacred and inviolable. So what are you going to do about it? That is where rebellion breaks through the surface. Rebellion is a challenge to the power to the authority, to good judgment, to the integrity, to the moral rectitude and peacekeeping ability of the one in authority. That's what rebellion is. It's a challenge to all of that. Rebellion does not contain itself merely in the one individual. Rebellion actively seeks to gather followers and to support to overthrow the authority. Listen to what God said about Israel on that subject. Deuteronomy 9, verse 7. Remember and forget not how thou provokest. You know, so what are you going to do about it? Provokest the Lord thy God to wrath in the wilderness. From the day that thou didst depart out of the land of Egypt until you came into this place, you have been rebellious against the Lord. Verse 24. You have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. It's not something that just sort of happened and grew over a period of time. From the day that I knew you. Isn't it amazing that God chose Israel? Isn't it amazing that God chose you? Isn't it amazing that God chose me? From the day that I knew you, you've been rebellious. Chapter 31, verse 27, Deuteronomy. I know thy rebellion and thy stiff neck. Behold, while I am yet alive with you this day, Moses speaking, ye have been rebellious against the Lord, and how much more after my death? Little did he know. Moses had a struggle as a leader. I don't know if you picked that up as you've gone through the text and read these passages many different times. But Moses was trying to lead a very difficult people. I think there are probably lots of pastors who felt the same way. How much more after my death, says Moses. You know, there's some practical consequences for rebellion. Practical consequences. Psalm 68, 6. God set up the solitary in families. He bringeth out those which are bound with chains, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. The Lord is the good shepherd. Psalm 23, you know, he leads us by the still waters. He restores our soul. But the rebellious dwell in a dry land. God still offers mercy even for the rebellious. Just 12 verses later in that same psalm. And it's quoted, by the way, in the book of Ephesians in the New Testament. 
Thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive, thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. <laughs> it was the mercy of God that spared Israel and didn't destroy them in the wilderness. Listen to what Isaiah says in 65 2. I have spread out my hands all day unto a rebellious people which walketh in a way that was not good and after their own thoughts. God still stretches out his hands to them. God's design is to break the intergenerational cycle of rebellion. You know, kids tend to be like their parents, only worse. God's design is to break that intergenerational cycle of rebellion. Psalm 78, verse 8. And might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their hearts right and whose spirit was not steadfast with God, that they might not be like their fathers. I'm a parent. I see my defects magnified in my children. Only God can reach down and break that cycle. There was a cycle in the book of Judges. The people would sin, they'd get worse and worse, God would finally send judgment. The people would finally repent, cry out to God, God would send a deliverer, he'd send them the next judge. The judge would give them peace for a period of time, but the people would go back to their old ways and they would sin and they would get worse and worse and God would send them more judgment. And then the people would finally cry out and repent and God would raise up another judge. That cycle, you see it over and over and over and over and over and over and over in the book of Judges. God is the only one who can break through to the cycle. The way he does it is he brings the tough times. Rebellious leaders produce rebellious people, that is, leaders who do not follow what God requires in the Bible for leadership. Listen to Isaiah 123. Thy princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loveth gifts, that's the word for bribes, and followeth after rewards. They judge not the fatherless, neither doth the cause of the widow come unto them. The princes are rebellious, and he goes on and talks about how the people are rebellious. Rebellion results in rebels following bad advice to their own destruction. Did you know that a rebel will never get good advice? If you're a rebel, you're going to listen to bad advice. The Bible guarantees it. If you're a, bell, a rebel, if you're doing what you know God doesn't want you to do, you're going to start getting some bad advice. And you're going to listen to it and say, boy, that sounds pretty good. Did you know God lets you listen to the bad advice because he's going to bring judgment? Isaiah chapter 30, verse 1. Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, they're looking for advice, that take counsel, but not of me, and that cover with a covering, they're trying to cover everything over, make sure that it's okay, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people which walketh in the way that was not good after their own thoughts. They've taken counsel. They figured it out in their own head. Ah, this is the way to do it. They followed the ways of the world. They decided that we'll do it the world's way because that looks like what brings success. We will not follow God's ways. And what are they doing? Isaiah says they're adding sin to sin. Rebellion produces lies and law-breaking. It produces lies because <laughs> the devil is the father of all lies and rebellion is following Satan's ways instead of God's ways. Listen to this, Isaiah 30 verse 9. That this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord. Rebellion produces lies and law-breaking. But there's a, an opposite side, a flip side to that coin. If you reject rebellion, God will give you understanding. Isaiah 50 verse 5. The Lord God hath opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. That's the flip side of the coin. You can go in the way of rebellion. You'll get the consequences. You'll end up with bad counsel. You'll end up with a destroyed life. 
you can choose to say, I will not rebel, I will submit, and God will give you understanding. He will open your ears. Rebellion, like all sin, begins in the heart, Jeremiah 5.23, but this people hath a revolting and a rebellious heart. They are revolted and gone. Remember what James said on that subject? Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust, that's what begins in the heart. When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. There's where it breaks out into rebellion. And what's the end of that? And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. You know what you're supposed to be doing? You're not doing it. You know where you're heading? Maybe today. Death. Lust, when it hath conceived, bringeth forth sin. What is it that you desire? What is it that chains you down? What is it that holds you down? What is it that's got a grip on your life? Lust, when it hath conceived, bringeth forth sin. And so you can't, you think, avoid it. And so you go for it, and you go for it, and you go for it. Remember 1 Corinthians 10, 13, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Don't say it's too strong for you. It's not. If you say it's too strong for you, you're calling God a liar. And it is a very unsafe thing to call God a liar. Lust, when it hath conceived, bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. That's what the Bible says. The Bible is God's word. You will stand before God, whether you like it or not. You've heard the message. You know the truth. Question, what are you going to do with it? You say you're a Christian. How has it changed your life? Ezekiel has more to say about the rebellion of Israel than any of the Old Testament prophets. Israel started its rebellion in the days of Moses, that's 1445 B.C., that's the Exodus, all the way down to the days of Ezekiel, 597 B.C., during the second deportation of the Babylonian captivity. There were three deportations, one in 605 B.C., the first one, where all the princes and all the nobles were taken captive to Babylon. The second one, where all the artisans and tradesmen were taken captive, that's the one that Ezekiel went into, that was 597 B.C., the final deportation and the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. BC. But from 1445 to 597 BC is 900 years. They've been in rebellion for 900 years. Ezekiel 2 3. And he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel to a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me even unto this very day can't believe it. Our time is gone. In fact, we're way over time. I'm going to stop there. We will pick it up there, the Lord willing, next week. Gracious Heavenly Father, we see that you hate those who are stiff-necked and stubborn and rebellious. You send your judgment against them. Your wrath is raised against them. Gracious Father, we pray that you will keep us from being a stiff-necked people. We pray that you will keep us from being a stubborn people. We pray that you will keep us from being a rebellious people. And rebellion is whenever we know your word and we choose to go a different way. It's when it breaks out in our life. And we've decided we're not going to do it God's way. We're going to do it our way. Father, forgive us for we have sinned. Cleanse us of our wickedness. Cause our hearts not merely to be sorry that we've been caught, but give our hearts true repentance. For repentance must precede blessing. It was true with Israel. It is the key to their return to the land. It is the key to our fellowship with you. Father, we pray that you'll take the word of God and use it in our hearts today, for it is your word and it will not return void. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning.